what is postmodernism, in, in some regards is quite difficult to answer because there's lots of different interpretations, lots of different kind of facets of how people interpret that. But it is generally, it's an ideological, philosophical framework um, to interpret uh, various aspects of life, so architecture, film, music, popular culture. It is, it is difficult to define and there are different opinions about what, what it actually means. Um, and I guess we're still in it. So this idea of postmodernism. Postmodernism to me is all about the world as it is, a dystopic ending and not so much uh, stories, films tied up like fairy tales with happy endings. A good example that might exemplify me and my attitude to postmodernism and how I define it would be Fight Club. That you can rail against the world, but ultimately uh, you're probably your own worst enemy. Two very big questions. Postmodernist film and characterisation and narrative structure. In the uh, olden days of film, you'd have good guys and bad guys. Um, and generally usually male because there was more representation of males on screen than females and continues to be to this day. So then for a Western, for example, you would have very good cowboys and very bad Indians. And that was it. And then as postmodernism and revisionist Westerns came into being, one example is Kevin Costner's uh, Dances with Wolves, where you had good and bad Indians and good and bad cowboys. So it was a more realistic look at um, what the West was likely to be, even though of course Dances with Wolves is a fictional film and an Oscar winning drama. The thing that defines postmodernist films and uh, approaches to film in a postmodern um, way is that it generally has a cynical kind of um, cynical aspect to it. It's uh, like an irony. Irony is a big um, aspect that can be identified as in the intention of the filmmaker may not be consistent with how uh, the audience is responding to it or might be reinterpreting something. It might be referencing a character from another era and reinterpreting it for a modern audience uh, in a slightly different way, in an ironic way. And so I guess things like also like a, a, a non-resolved ending is sometimes seen as a, a post-modern approach, as opposed to tr traditional films where they might have a nice happy ending, all the loose ends are, are wrapped up. A post-modern approach will often um, not comply to certain rules or genres that have been established. Like, as I said in my other response, everything's wrapped up nice and neatly. All the characters and all the storylines, nothing's left unresolved. Whereas po a postmodern approach, they may not use that. Or they might have a character might be played by several different actors in the same film. Some of the films that I believe you, that use a postmodern um, film narrative characterization, <laughs> narrative structure, I mean, there's lots of different ones. They started to emerge maybe around the late 60s, but then when the 90s came along, it was almost like that, that was a defining approach to filmmaking in that era. And so some of the films, I've got a little list here. I've written it on a conventional you know, piece of paper, but I, you know, I could have made notes on this. But th I think Blade Runner is a, a significant film. It was before its time in a lot of ways, but then there's a whole heap. The one that comes to mind for most film students is Pulp Fiction. I guess the definition of Pulp Fiction is that it's, it's popular, it's mass produced. And so in a way, it kind of, I can't be too harsh on Pulp Fiction, but it is, I guess it's a really significant milestone in terms of, um, that the, that approach to filmmaking, but some of the earlier films, things, films like Taxi Driver, I guess as I said, Blade Runner, even Monty Python is a a really great um, example in that they're referencing other films, other popular culture that's come before it, 
and then incorporating it into their own structures. Okay, video games represent almost like a, a core aspect of postmodernism in that they haven't existed for all that long, historically, and they're certainly more popular than ever. And so it's really interesting to see crossovers of certain films, like there's a film called Elephant. And so this kind of whole concept of hyper-reality, hyper, you know, enhanced reality, or um, virtual environments is becoming increasingly relevant to uh, like an end user, consumer, an audience. And so with technology, it's become more and more easier for creative people, game designers, to start to incorporate, I, I guess, lots of ideas to reference other uh, genres or historical periods of time into their game design. And so, but see, in principle, there's lots of, the whole concept of hyper-reality and Mario going through the swimming thing or whatever, and then that as a thing, everyone of a certain generation has experienced that. So then that's now embedded within their understanding almost. So, um, I get, and then there's no going back as well. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is quite a unique, quite a unique game, being from such a well-known franchise. It follows quite a unique narrative structure that kind of feels like Groundhog Day. Films that use postmodern characterisation and narrative structure, I guess a classic from the 90s would be uh, The Usual Suspects. So you have the least likely person being the ringleader of an incredibly strong and able gang. And of course the bad guy gets away at the end, which is, oh, if anyone hasn't seen it, <laughs> sorry, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. But The Usual Suspects, I think, is very much sums up postmodernism. I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! Any of you fucking people! 